Hi, welcome to The Bridge Connection. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 2 with me. We went through the first 12 verses yesterday. We'll start at verse 13 today, so get your Bibles ready. All right. Um, I, I just kind of want to think out loud today. I've, I, I kind of titled this in my own heart. I don't usually title my, my studies on uh, that we're doing this way. I just go through the word here, but um, it's just, I call this the tough and the tender Jesus. And I believe that's, as we see what I'm talking about, we're going to see what, uh, maybe some adjustments we need to make in our own lives. And, uh, but I think the Lord just wants to kind of, uh, stimulate our thinking a little bit today. Okay. Let's pick it up at verse 13, chapter two, gospel of Mark. Then he went out again by the sea. And all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many, and they followed him. So who's following him? tax collectors and sinners. First part of verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, who are these? These are the religious people, okay? These are the church folks. And pick it up in the middle of verse 16. They said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to him, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Um, a couple of things come out of this for me. Uh, first, the clarification of his ministry. I'm, I'm not here for people who have no needs. He's saying, I'm, I'm not here for people who don't think they have any problems. I'm not here for people who think that they've arrived. I'm not here for people who consider themselves to be well with, with no problems. That's not why I'm here. Let me ask you a question. Um, <laughs> wherever, wherever you go to church, uh, when, when you show up next Sunday, uh, if Jesus were physically in your city that particular day, do you think he would visit your church? or any other church in, in your area? Well, I'll, I'll say quickly for you, no, I don't, I don't think so. I know now, he's, surely he's in our churches, no doubt about it. We have the benefit of the new, new covenant of grace. He's with us in spirit. He's, he's uh, you know, omnipresent, and he's committed himself to, to dwell in the presence of his people, and he lives within us. I understand that. He's in our churches. He's saving people and healing us and doing those things. So I do not deny, deny his presence. But if Jesus were, this is what I was saying, I think, if Jesus were limited to appearance in one location, would he be summoning the unrighteous, giving himself away to those who are sick or, or in need? Question. Second thing that I think comes out of this text that is so rich and clarification is this. Evidently, Jesus is the kind of people who can be with sinners without compromise. He doesn't sacrifice his standards. He doesn't abandon his principles. He's not becoming something other than what he is. Who, who is he? He's the pure one, the sinless one, the mighty one of God. And yet, even though he remains who he is, the perfect one, at the same time, there is something about him that doesn't frighten them away, that doesn't reject them. Rather, they seem to flock to him. Now, we understand that Jesus' basic message was, the kingdom of God is here among you, and is, is here now. And he taught us about the ethics of the kingdom. As we go to Matthew chapter 5 through 7, that's what the kingdom is all about. That's the ethics, how, that's how we're supposed to live. Uh, and if you read that, that section, uh, you, you, you sit back and say, 
Now that's tough stuff, man. You know, he would say things like, have you ever heard that? Yes. Well, I say, and then he makes it twice as hard. Have you ever committed adultery? Well, what I say, have you ever thought in your heart about it? You With somebody, you've, you've committed adultery. And it goes on and on and on. And he took it so much further. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that he teaches tough. He holds nothing back. He shoots from the hip. He says things like, if your hand offends you, cut it off. I mean, there's not an ounce of compromise. He's not really telling you to cut the hand off, but whatever's causing the thing, deal with it. Don't just uh, compromise and, and justify. He says, deal whatever it is that's, that's causing you not to be everything that you're supposed to be. Yet as tough as the message is, this is what I'm trying to say, the sinner just feels no, these sinners he's sitting with, just feel no intimidation whatsoever. They'll sit down and they'll fellowship with him. And I find that absolutely delightful. I find that absolutely fantastic. Even though there's not an ounce of compromise in him, at the same time, there's not an ounce of condemnation to other people. He does not ever abandon his purity, but he doesn't use his personal holiness to, you know, pummel people, you know, under the ground. So the ministry of Jesus is, is to the sinners at number one. And secondly, he conducts himself in such a way that he can come and associate without intimidation. Uh, I just think this is, that's why I call this the tough and tender Jesus. And I'm just going to be very personal today and just talking to folks I know. And if you're listening and don't know me, uh, yeah, maybe you know my heart after listening for a while, but um, I'm just sharing with you, you know, the reason we're dealing with this is I just kind of, like I said, want to wander around in the Word and wonder out loud with, with us today about where we've come in our own personal sharing of our faith. How do we view ministry? Let me just make a couple observations. It appears to me that, that people who have been delivered from great bondage, great sins, great bondage, these people are natural in sharing their faith. They don't need any motivation. They just want to tell everybody, once I was lost, but now I'm found. I was in the depths of sin, but now I'm free. I was bound up in these drugs, but God broke the bondage and the chains, and I'm, I'm set free. It's just a natural sharing of their faith. They need no motivation. They just so naturally talk about how Jesus saved them just in the midst of, of just living life. Jesus saved them. In fact, Jesus tells a story about this. He's talking to Simon one day, and he, he said to Simon, Simon, two people have been forgiven. One owes 500 million and the other owes $5. They both owe, but neither can pay. Simon, which one of these will love the most? The one who was forgiven the most. People who have been rescued out of great personal distress, whatever it was, whatever kind it was, tend to love more openly and publicly and can share their faith with, without being motivated by guilt or, or any other type of manipulation. They just love to talk about what Jesus has done for them. Then there are others who uh, were quite genuinely saved, no doubt about it, but maybe it was more on principle or maybe it was at a young age and, and they tend to be more uh, embarrassed at, at, at the sharing of their faith and want others to do that for them. Let me just make a couple observations. We tend to go in cycles. There are periods of an infusion of personal ministry with, with lots of stuff happening. You know, uh, the people, you know, mature and begin to take on the, 
the accoutrements of the church and less and less personal ministry happens. So when we're first saved, there's that zeal, there's that excitement. And then, you know, we, we get to church and, and then we get in all the activities and all the stuff that's going on. I'm not coming against any of those, but we begin to take on those things. And there's no longer a lot of personal ministry. We're inviting people maybe to the activities at the church. That, that's good. But there's less of just, let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Let me tell you what Jesus wants. Let me tell you what Jesus wants to do in your life. You know. Um, and it just seems we move from the personal sharing our, of our faith. And it becomes difficult for, for some of us to hear this. But I tell you, people really want to know what God's done in your life. They, they don't want to know what Greg Laurie believes. They want, don't want to know what Franklin Graham believes. They, they want to know, they don't want to know what Billy Graham used to teach, but they want to know. Most people, you know, want to know what you believe. Your friends, your family, your acquaintances, they want to know what you believe. I make the observation that it's, that, that it's not even developing techniques. It's not learning the, the skills, but what really affects people is the sin sincerity of our lives. People simply want to know it's real. Is what you have real? So it's really not just the sharing of some programmed liturgical response, but it's life touching life that really affects people. So it's not me just always talking to people. I'm supposed to talk when Jesus has me talk, of course, and you when you're supposed to talk. But it's living a life. It's that Jesus has changed our attitudes. He's changed our desires. He's changed the things we say. He's changed the things we look at. He's changed the stories we listen to. He changes the movies that we'll watch. He, he changes where we spend our time. And, and people want to watch that and, and see, wow, they're happy. That, that person has a fulfillment and they don't do this or do that or, or, or whatever. It's, it's, let me ask you three questions that I think come out of this text. Number one, who's hanging around you? Not who are you hanging around? That's not, that's not what I'm asking. Okay. But the question is, who wants to be with you these days? Okay. Um, who, who wants to be with you? The second question, is anybody coming to be with because, be with you because they sense you have something they need? Are there people that have watched your life and they're coming around? Can I talk about your family? Can I talk about your faith? Can I talk about where you, I see you going to church every week and you seem to be happy over here. My family's falling apart. I don't know what to do. Are, are there people f coming around? Or thirdly, have we become so Christian that we turn people off with our language, with our Christianese, with our with our actions, with our holier-than-thou attitude, with our judgmentalism. And it's so easy to do that, not intentionally. But see, Jesus didn't do that. He sat with the sinners and loved on them and talked to them and didn't compromise who he was or his message, but they felt comfortable in listening because at the same time, he wasn't condemning them. Um, let me try this. And I've been thinking about this for a couple of days to to try this and with you, and let's just see how it goes, okay? Let's just say you've new, moved into a new neighborhood and you want to be friendly with your neighbors. So for six months, the time goes by and you become friends and a friendship, you know, kind of develops. And, uh, and then one day, your neighbor comes to you and says, you know, we've really become good friends and we just like to ask you a favor. See, so anything, man. We'd like to share our faith with you. And now you're getting excited. You know, hey, they want to share their faith with me. They, 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 they're believers, and this is going to be so great. And then they say, we'd like you to worship with us next Sunday. And you're beginning to be all excited and thrilled, man. I'll, I'll, get, I'll go to their church and then come to our church, and we have things to talk about until the guy says, we're Buddhists. And you say, Okay, well, we'll go, absolutely. 
And the guy leaves smiling because he's getting to share his faith with you. And you turn around and you go back in the house. You say, honey, guess where we're going next Sunday? Then you discuss it with your wife and then you call the guy on the phone because uh, you're really nervous about this and, and uh, you're wondering what they're like. Uh, what, what are they going to do? Uh, what are they going to make me do? Uh, what am I going to, I don't know what's going to go on. So you call him on the phone and say, well, we're still going with you. No problem, but we've got another commitment right after church. And so we're going to take our own car. I mean, let's face it. That just makes common sense. If anything happens, we're out of here, Jack. I mean, that's just it. We're, we're gone. We don't know what's going to happen. So Sunday comes and you're following this guy to the Buddhist temple and you're saying to your wife, I don't know what they're going to do. They probably chant. I don't know how to chant. Honey, do you know how to chant? And they probably burn incense. What do we do? Do we inhale the incense? Well, I don't know what, what to do. do. Do you get it yet? You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about our church. I'm talking about the church that I'm one of the pastors. I'm talking about your church, okay? What do you think people off the street think when you invite them to church? What are they going to make me do? I, I don't know their chance. See, I am very comfortable with what we do at our church but I've been there since 1972. So perhaps I'm, I'm too comfortable. Perhaps we have become so inclined toward a specific style of worship that it's difficult for people to come and flock to Jesus comfortably like they did when he was here. They came and they flocked to him. He taught them truth. He shared things. He loved on them. He never changed who he was, but they were comfortable. Hmm. Perhaps we have become so inclined toward a specific style, like I said, of the way we sing, the way we worship, what, is it, what, what we do. So the question goes back to who really wants to hang around me? Who really wants to hang around you? Does, does my life exude purpose and contentment and peace and joy? Or does it exude some kind of self-righteousness that I, I'm leaving the impression I think I'm better than everybody else. I told somebody just the other day that I was sharing with, I said, you know, hey, my friend, I'm, 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 I'm just a sinner saved by grace, just like you are, just like God wants to do in your life. Sinner saved by grace. You know, we, we have nothing that, you know, in me dwells no good thing, the Bible says. Can we, without compromise, be comfortable for people to be around without rejecting them or frightening them away? Something to think about. You know, and I'm just going to run around a little bit and talk about some stuff. It's without compromise and at the same time, without condemnation. Teaching, yet being tender. Here's my last question, we're done. How do we view ministry? Can you visualize Jesus sitting around the table sharing his life with you? Can you visualize that? That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. I, I, I'm hoping that we just would catch a, a picture of how God wants us to do things and that we'd be willing to adjust if necessary. Because Jesus came to summon the sick and the unrighteous. And we want to partner with him in such a way that it would never happen where we go or in our lives or in our neighborhood or in our house where people would feel rejected because if they were around us or feel condemned because they were around us. Concern is when you know in your head that people need to know Jesus. Compassion is when you know in your heart, people need to know Jesus. So concern is when you know in your head. Compassion is when you know in your heart. Conviction is when you finally see it's 
your responsibility, my personal responsibility to communicate to those whom God has sovereignly placed with us our faith in Jesus. Just concern usually builds ideology. Then you put compassion with it that usually builds sensitivity. Nothing wrong with that. But conviction is when we finally decide to do something. That's what building character and that's the stuff that mighty moves of God are made of. That's the stuff that revivals are made of. That when we look at ourselves and say, we want to be like Jesus, transform us into your image. Let us be tough and tender. Let us not compromise, but let us have compassion, be tender and not run people off by how we act or what we do. I don't have the answer to all the questions I gave. I'm working this through myself. And as I was looking at this passage, you know, this week to share it today, just all these questions came up. So I just thought I'd share them with you and we can work them through together in our lives as we're making ourselves available to uh, have conviction that people need to know about Jesus and they need to know he, who he really is in our lives. And we have the conviction to share that with compassion and concern. All right, got to stop there. Father, I thank you for just a different kind of time together today. Just some thoughts I had running around in my head, Lord, as I as I watch you, Jesus, and and dealing with people, and you know they sat down, crowds listened to you, and and Lord, I I just I love that. And Lord, we want to be those kinds of people. We're not going to compromise. We don't compromise at all. We want to live solidly who we are. And you did. You never compromised. We don't want to compromise. And we won't, don't want to condemn by looking down or thinking we're better. We're not. We're just a bunch of folks that's been saved by your grace, Lord. Thank you that you are who you are in our lives. Thank you. We surrender ourselves to you. I, I ask that you help me as others are asking the same question to be your kids that would sit around with people and share our faith. Sit around the table and share your love without compromise, but without putting down or turning away in any way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a good day and uh, got one more day this week. See you tomorrow. Bye.